Hello everyone, welcome to our first online class. I um, want to remind you before we get started looking at Renaissance art of what's happening next class. Uh, you do have an article to read by a guy named Craig Harbison about a painting by an artist named Jan van Eyck and I'll talk about it a little bit at the end of uh, this class. Um, and you have a summary to write for that, as always, one page, single space, typed, submitted online via Sakai. Uh, and the one other thing I want to remind you of is we have our first lecture quiz coming up. Um, remember to bring your notes and to take some notes today, just as you would in class as you listen to our lecture here. All right, so we've just got done watching uh, for two classes uh, a documentary uh, about the Renaissance uh, and the Medici family in the Renaissance. Um, I'll refer to that documentary a lot today because a lot of what we will see was covered in the documentary, uh, or at least some crucial points were touched upon in the documentary. But just to take you back for a moment um, to what was happening prior to watching the documentary, uh, remember that word Renaissance, I hope you know by now, uh, Renaissance means rebirth, and so it's an important moment where we look back and say something died and something else was reborn, and that thing which died was what you see on your screen right now. This is art from the era we typically refer to as the medieval era. Um, roughly, we're talking here from about the year 1100 to about 1400, if you want to get a sense of time. During that period, uh, as I mentioned before, essentially, if you saw art, you saw it in this context. You saw it inside and outside on the building of a church, or in this case, a cathedral. Um, sculptures of human beings almost always were done in a relatively unrealistic style, and they were stuck on the outside pillars, so they were made to kind of conform to the building rather than the building revolving around the sculptures. Um, the degree of realism in them was very low compared to at least what we've seen uh, the Greeks and the Romans do previous uh, because they weren't that concerned with it. Honestly. It wasn't about lack of skill. It was about wanting something that looked different than what the Greek and Romans did, wanting a style that belonged to Christianity. Uh, and when we look at paintings, when you get inside a cathedral, you might see icons or all pieces. Um, the one up on the right-hand side of your screen is a good example of a, a standard icon. Uh, a couple of its features are you have a gold leaf background, um, not anything in the background other than just applied actual gold leaf. Um, this does a few things. One is it, it makes it seem like a very rich object, both, both in just technical terms because gold costs lots of money, uh, but also because it has a very loose quality, reflects light, uh, and if your goal is to create a powerful kind of otherworldly spiritual image, gold leaf is a good way to do it. Um, the Virgin and Chapel painted with a high degree of realism. Notice in the robe of the Virgin. Instead of when you get robes and you actually paint a robe, you realize there's light that changes and folds. It gets light in the high parts and dark in the low parts, and that's how you can tell the robe is undulating. Here, those undulations in fabric are conveyed simply by kind of gold leaf lines laid in. Um, her face, while recognizable as a human face, doesn't go too far beyond that. There isn't a lot of attention to creating a realistic looking face. We're going to see in the Renaissance, this is what is dying. And we'll see what artists are starting to do in very new ways here as we start to look at images. So this slide, I think, encapsulates the shift we're going to see. We've talked about uh, medieval cathedrals and specifically talked about how they fashion the relationship between God and man. For those of you who uh, have been in a cathedral before, um, uh, you know that as you go in you are very small. Um, even the doors, as you look at the image and look at the people, you can see some people in this image of the cathedral on the left. On the, the portal on the left there you see, see some people standing at that door, and the door is about four times as high as the person. 
So even when you first walk up to it, you're really just dwarfed by these doors. Uh, the facade shoots straight up out of the ground, is covered in decoration, extremely impressive and intimidating. And when you walk inside, it just keeps getting more impressive and intimidating. You're really dwarfed by the space, and we'll, we'll see some more images of the interior. But in a nutshell, what this does is it, it posits a relationship between God and man that is a rather unequal one. Uh, where God is a very different, m inestimably more powerful and influential and important than you are. Uh, you know when you walk up to these buildings, you are a very small piece of dust kind of blowing around in the universe, whereas this is God. The building symbolizes the power of God, and you are dwarfed by it to the degree that you're bordering on insignificant. Um, the, the gap between man and God is, is very wide. What we see in da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, though, uh, which is a kind of centerpiece image of the Renaissance in a lot of ways, is a very different estimation. Now, it's apparently very clear to you it's about man. Um, it may not be so apparent that it's apparent that it's about God, but I'm going to posit that it is. Uh, we have this image of man body circumscribed by a square and a circle. Um, we'll talk about this, but to give you just a quick preview, the square and the circle are not just random things. They are not just things that da Vinci was curious about. The square and the circle are very important for Renaissance artists. They're important because the square and the circle were believed to be the perfect units of measurement. Uh, and as such, they are the units of measurement God followed to create the universe. Um, God, during the Renaissance, becomes described in much more utilitarian terms. As a creator, um, what did he create? He created us. He created this planet. Um, and Renaissance artists start to think about that and explore what that might mean for us if we are created from God in his image, as it says in the Old Testament, can we then study ourselves and get access to God? Um, and what we have here in the Vitruvian, in a lot of ways, is that. It's an analysis of the human body and a connection between body and the perfect units of creation, the units of creation that God uses to create. So here we have an image where instead of man being this very small thing on the steps you can see over there, dwarfed by the door and the portal and the building. Instead, now man is the center of everything. Everything is revolving around mankind. Um, and so that shift in relationship between God and man is one thing that is really going to characterize this period known as the Renaissance. Um, I want to bring in these maps to start off with, um, just to make a point. Um, and that point is that our modern conception of nations uh, was not at all a conception that the people had during the Renaissance. On the left, if you see a map that probably looks familiar to you and you have um, borders that are drawn around places and uh, nations labeled as such, um, we're going back to a time when those types of borders and those types of loyalties, especially, to a nation did not really exist. Uh, in Italy, as you look at the larger map on your right, um, I brought this one in because it doesn't use the term Italy. Instead, it just has a bunch of cities and maybe regions like Tuscany, uh, and you see a few other kind of regions around. But generally speaking, it's just cities, and this is much more reflective of a Renaissance mindset. People didn't view themselves as Italians because they lived in Florence or in Rome. Um, they were just maybe starting to view themselves as even Romans or Florentines. Um, but uh, even beyond that, probably your family ties uh, and your friends are much more powerful and important than even your place, your city, or your region. Uh, but definitely there wasn't any sense that what we're dealing with here is Italy in its modern incarnation.
Um, now, where we're going to be spending most of our time, as you might guess due to the documentary, is in Florence. You can see Florence there just a little bit. If you see uh, the word Tuscany there on the west coast of uh, Italy, uh, a few cities above that, uh, you'll see Florence. Uh, you'll notice Florence is right there along a river. One of the reasons it was a powerful city, an important city, it was in a good position for trade. And that's going to be one of the things you'll see is its wealth is one of the things that allows Florence to change and one of the things that allows the Renaissance to really begin. I want to start looking at a work of art that I think is a transitional piece, kind of connecting the medieval era to what's going to happen in the Renaissance. But it it's crucial to see this process at least quickly. And it happens in a little chapel uh, in a town named Padua, and it's known as the Arena Chapel. The Arena Chapel was built um, at the behest of a rich old man who feared he was going to hell. Um, he was a usurer. Uh, that is a sin that most people don't consider to be a sin today, but in the Bible it is clearly laid out as a sin. A usurer is somebody who lends people money and charges them interest to pay it back. Um, that sounds like pretty common banking or lending practice to us, but uh, if you're uh, going by what the Bible really talks about, usury is in fact a sin. Uh, and there was a guy who was a a usurer who lent a lot of money during his life and made a lot of money by charging people interest. As he got near the end of his life, though, he was extremely worried about the possibility of uh, paying for his sins by burning in hell for eternity. One of the ways that rich people tended to try to buy their get-out-of-hell ticket card uh, during the medieval era and during the Renaissance and even later, as we'll see throughout the course, is by commissioning religious art. So um, uh, this guy paid for this chapel to be built, kind of a side chapel on a larger uh, church, um, and he paid for it to be decorated by an artist named Giotto. Uh, I want to look at the paintings Giotto does to try to see this transition. If you look inside the, the generic view here on your right, and you'll see that the ceiling is painted blue as if it were the sky or the heavens down beneath. Uh, in the center, it's kind of hard to see because it's small. There's a Last Judgment picture. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but you'll see other Last Judgments in this class. What we're going to look at is a couple uh, of the panels along the side. You can see along the walls. It's kind of like a large comic book, essentially, particularly around stories involving um, the Virgin. Uh, and I want to focus in really on one of these um, just to give you a better sense uh, the slide at top outlines everything going on. You can see that first you have um, the story of Mary, of the Madonna, the story of Jesus, um, and all down the list. And that lists everything, and then you can follow the numbers. But I'll let you do that on your own time if you want to. Uh, you get a little better sense in the bottom right hand what these kind of panels look like, little squares that are uh, broken up by paint uh, and sometimes architecture to define them as kind of single moments in a story. Uh, the one we're going to look at is one you can see there on the bottom left-hand corner, but uh, we'll get a little closer before we talk about it. This is an image uh, of Christ uh, come down from the cross, a pretty traditional moment where the, the body of Christ is brought down. You'll be seeing other works of art in our class that are uh, essentially the exact same subject. What I want to pay attention to, though, is less the subject and more the way it's painted. If we think, um, for contrast, say that that icon I showed you a few minutes ago on our first slide, uh, gold leaf background, the mother Mary holding her child. Um, notice the differences here. First of all, um, the gold leaf is really minimized. The only place you find it are in the, the halos. Everything else is painted. Um, behind the figures, you don't just get gold leaf, you get a sense of landscape or space of some sort. You get that rock formation going, a tree growing on it, and then kind of at least blue in the background. If you look at the clothing of the people, instead of using gold leaf lines to create the sense of folds in drapery or fabric, here artists are using color. They're using light and shadow, which is much more reflective of the natural world. Um, when you look at faces, 
and bodies, same thing. There's a greater attention to replicating them in ways that look accurate. Um, what I think is even more interesting, though, is the way in which emotion is portrayed. Um, I'm going to show you for comparison. This is a, uh, a little manuscript image done during the medieval era of basically the same subject. You have uh, Mary, the mother of Christ, grasping his uh, dead body before it goes in its tomb. Uh, not only do we have the absence of the gold uh, and the more realistic looking kind of painted uh, drapery, but I think what this comparison makes more apparent is the change in emotion. Notice in, on the left in our medieval image, uh, Mary grabs the face of Christ and kind of pulls it to hers, but experiences almost no emotion, as virtually the same could be said for almost any figure in the scene. Um, there wasn't a great deal of value in emotion in medieval imagery. It was about the story, about the narrative, about informing people about it. What Giotto does is he is really trying to not only make it look more real by including landscape and folds and drapery in natural ways, he's trying to make it feel more real. Uh, you see in the face of Mary there uh, some torment, some pain as she grasps the body of Christ. Um, that sense of torment um, is something that's pretty new and Giotto is bringing to the table. But that attention to real emotions and how you replicate emotions, how you make the person who's looking at your work of art feel those emotions is something that Renaissance artists are really going to start paying attention to. And so we see in Giotto not only things starting to look more real, but things starting to feel more real also. And that's important. And we'll see that uh, change as time goes on. Okay, for our, our next comparison, I want to deal with a piece of architecture. Uh, now, after watching the documentary about the Medici, you were introduced to a guy named Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi is the guy who solved the great problem of the age of how to build a dome on top of the Florence Cathedral, which didn't have a dome because nobody could figure out how to do it. Um, and he really was a kind of architectural and artistic genius. I want to show you one of the buildings which... He started building during his life, it wasn't finished until after he died, but it was built along his plans. And I think, again, it, sh it symbolizes a dramatic shift here in the medieval, uh, from the medieval to the Renaissance. So if, if our medieval cathedral there on your right, notice just on the outside the dramatic differences here. Now, you, you maintain some similarities. There's still these kind of three doors. There is still a kind of large round window up in the center, as you had in our medieval cathedrals. But outside of that, this is an entirely different looking building. It is not as vertically oriented. It is much kind of broader, uh, much more balanced, this kind of triangle. Um, you have kind of oddly placed circular forms. Um, I think this comparison, though, becomes even more apparent as we get inside the building. So that's what I want to look at here. Once inside Santo Spirito, notice the difference. Again, if, if one of the things I think is really important to consider when you're looking at churches is how does a church make a person feel inside of it? And how does it, how does the architecture articulate the relationship between that person and the God they're going there to worship? Notice the difference. Um, whereas the cathedral on your right really dwarfs you. All the arches are pointed arches. They extend very high into the air and then they point to the top. The ceiling itself is made up of arches coming together, and it is pointed. You see it all the way down the cathedral. Um, a very dramatic space, but very um, intimidating. It really dwarfs you as a viewer in that spot and makes you, again, feel kind of insignificant. Notice the difference of Brunelleschi's space, though. Um, much different. Uh, the arches are not pointed. The columns are much shorter, so they're not quite as large. They're still large. But it's a more contained space. The ceiling on top is, is lower. It's flattened. Um, uh, there is a def different sensation in the building. Instead of being engulfed and dwarfed and overwhelmed, it's a much more kind of harmonious space. Um, it's more balanced. 
more comfortable in a lot of ways because it doesn't dwarf you so substantially. Not as awe-inspiring, but, but that's the point. Um, if you are awe-inspired, you are inspired by the awe of God, uh, his power, his glory. Um, over here, there's something different. I want you to notice in this building the way in which squares and circles really dominate uh, the space. Uh, we talked about this a little bit with this image with um, da Vinci. And I want to expand on that a little bit, and then we'll come back and look at it. So da Vinci, this he's a little bit after Brunelleschi, but this image encapsulates ideas which Brunelleschi was dealing with when he built Santo Spirito. Um, this image of man as the centerpiece of the universe. Um, the idea that if we study man and understand man, it will get us nearer to God because God is because man is God's chief creation, is at the centerpiece of what Leonardo is doing. Um, and you see the ways in which he uses the square and the circle as the fundamental elements of creation. Um, I wonder while we're looking at this image though, just expand a little bit on what it really means now. If mankind is no longer a speck of dust, you know, that blows around in the wind and is insignificant in relation to God, but instead mankind is now kind of the centerpiece of God's creations, how does that change uh, what we have here? How does that change uh, how people feel about life? How does it change politics? How does it change religion? How does it change culture? Um, uh, and this is one of those moments where if you were in person, I would probably ask you this question, but since you're not, I'll provide you some of the things that usually come up in our discussions. Um, if you had to think about that, if man is now really important, if man is now the chief creation of God, how might that also change the world? Think about politics. Um, in all honesty, you can think back to the other time in which man was very important in art, and that would take you back to the Greek era. Uh, the discus throw we looked at, we talked about, what does that say about a society that values this? Well, it values the common man, um, and that has political implications. We saw the rise of democracy for the first time there. We don't get full-fledged democracy here in Florence, but we get something getting toward it at least. It's a kind of Republican-based system where people are casting votes for the people who are ruling over them to some degree at least. There's no king. Um, uh, basically, Florence is run by uh, a council of kind of elders, and there are votes taken uh, at times to determine who those people are. So. Uh, a political system in which man is more significant. Um, uh, culturally, if man is important, um, things change. One of the things that becomes extremely important in the Renaissance is the concept of education, um, learning. Uh, if man is this chief creation of God, then maybe we ought to determine what God has given us and, and utilize it. And one of the things he's given us is our minds. Um, and if we're to fulfill what God intends for us, we need to use those things to the best of our ability. Uh, so when da Vinci here is exploring the body, exploring the body's relation to these geometric shapes, um, we see this sense of learning, of understanding, of exploring. And all these ideas are going to become very important in the Renaissance, this concept of education, of teaching, of learning, of reading. And it's going to be dangerous from a lot of people's perspective. It's the rebirth of the classical era, of not only the art of that era, but of the thinkers of that era, people like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, the great philosophers of history, whose ideas are from, were from at least Christians' perspectives pagan, but people were starting to say that that isn't what matters. What matters is do they get us closer to God or not? Uh, and so those ideas, um, you might even guess here because we have a kind of geometric drawing uh, math becomes extremely important uh, as learning becomes important. People start to pick apart the body, nature, the universe, and they realize math is extremely helpful. And you have bankers who kind of like math too, or at least they need math to do what they do. So coming back to Santo Spirito, you see the ways in which those circles and squares, which da Vinci used to inscribe the body, these elements of creation, now are being employed by the architect here, that if 
God decided the circle and the square were the elements that he would create with, um, perhaps as an artist, I ought to do the same thing. And we're going to see the ways in which that idea has some pretty substantial implications also for what an artist is, or at least what an artist wants to think he is and what he wants to claim he or she is. The next um, work of art I want to point out is a sculptor is a sculpture by a sculptor named Donatello. You were introduced to Donatello briefly uh, in the Medici documentary, um, specifically Donatello's David, which we'll look at in just a minute. But before we get to that, I want to look at Donatello's sculpture of Saint Mark. Uh, now this sculpture is on the outside of a building. It's not on the outside of a church, it's actually on the outside of a building that was uh, built to store and distribute grain to citizens. Um, it did have a kind of uh, religious function in that feeding the poor um, is a religious duty, in uh, Christianity at least. Um, but it, it wasn't a building, at least it was a cathedral. Uh, that being said, the idea of putting a religious sculpture on the outside of a building stems largely from what we saw in cathedrals. Um, but Donatello's version of Saint version of Saint Mark looks dramatically different than what we saw uh, on our medieval cathedral outside buildings. Um, so a couple things I want to point out uh, is first off, we still have the sculpture on the outside of the building. But now the sculpture really stands on its own. The point of the sculpture is the sculpture itself, um, rather than we have a building and we have a pillar here and we want to decorate it with something, so why not we put a sculpture of Mark on the outside? Uh, instead, we have now uh, a space constructed just for the sculpture, a little niche carved out, um, a little hollow space uh, created for the sculpture to sit in, rather than the sculpture having to be kind of tied to the outside of the column as it is um, on the, the outside of a medieval cathedral. Uh, now, independent of that, though, we also have some very distinct precedents going on here. One thing you might have seen uh, before, and if you didn't before, you probably do now, is you recognize that Donatello here very distinctly is reaching back towards the classical past. Uh, we saw that a little bit with uh, Santo Spirito, Brunelleschi's church. We see Roman arches instead of the pointed arches, which became associated with the medieval era. But probably even more directly, here in Donatello's St. Mark, you can see the ways in which he is basing his sculpture of a Christian saint on these old uh, bases that Greek sculptors used and invented um, couple thousand years ago. Uh, you can see that famous pose or posture known as contrapposto uh, outlined there in the center where the one foot is back and not bearing the weight and one arm is in motion, the chest goes one way and the head turns the other. Um, it, and you see it there obviously in our Riace warrior. Uh, when we look at Donatello's sculpture, while we don't have the nudity uh, that we would have had in ancient Greece yet, we clearly see a sculptor who is looking toward classical precedents. Um, uh, not doing what his medieval Christian forebears had done, but rather trying to make a sculpture out of marble that looks much more like our Riace warrior or the Doriferous sculpture um, there in the center. Um, so we see early in the 1400s, I mean, we're only in 1411 through 13, there's already this dramatic new change where sculptures are starting to look um, like they did back in ancient Greece. Now, probably Donatello's most famous work of art is his sculpture of the David, which comes a couple decades later into his career. Um, you saw it briefly in the film, and I'll mention a few things that were mentioned in the documentary also, and maybe point out a few others. Um, as you know from the documentary, this was a private commission by Cosimo de' Medici. One of the reasons art changes 
during the Italian Renaissance, when art just starts to look different, is because we have new people that are paying for art. Um, through most of the medieval era, there are only two patrons of art. And a patron, uh, again, is just somebody who pays for art. Um, those patrons would be the church, uh, represented usually by the pope or a bishop or something, uh, and a king. Uh, independent of that, there weren't a lot of really wealthy people who could afford to commission art. Uh, you might have some kind of wealthy people, aristocratic people at times who would commission art, but generally speaking, through the medieval era, church was largely confined to kings and uh, religious buildings or religious palaces. One of the things you saw in the documentary we get new is we get this family, the Medici. Now, the Medici are not powerful because they have lineage. They're not powerful because there were knights in their background or they were born of kings way back when, when you trace their lineage. They're powerful because they have money and they have figured out how to take that money and make more money. Um, and they use and they have that money to create power. But money in this society doesn't just equal power. You have to figure out how to turn money into power. Uh, and patronage of art is one way you can do that. Um, Brunelleschi's dome uh, that was featured in the documentary is a perfect example of that. It's something everybody knows about. And if you spend money to build that dome and you solve the problem nobody else can solve, you are going to be the t center of attention. People are going to love you. And that translates into political power. This is different, though. This sculpture has absolutely nothing to do with taking your money and translating it into political power. The other thing you get when you have extremely wealthy people um, who aren't tied to the church or even to uh, the idea of ruling necessarily is you get them starting to use art to just explore things they find interesting. Uh, whatever they might like, how it looks, a subject, whatever it might be. If you have money, you can tell a sculptor to do it how you want them to do what you're interested in. And that's what we get here with Donatello's David. This was a private commission that wasn't going to be displayed in public. It was going to be always inside the Medici home. Uh, there is no way <laughs> Cosimo de' Medici would have uh, let this sculpture leave his home and become the public face of what he pays for this art. Because this is an extremely scandalous sculpture. Um, we tend, we've had this discussion a little bit before about nudity. We tend to distance ourselves now uh, from nudity in great art um, in that we kind of strip it of its erotic content. We see nudity as this kind of precedent that great artists uh, established and other great artists followed, and it's art. It's not uh, pornography or something like that where we might draw a line. Um, that being said... <laughs> Uh, this sculpture is uh, it pushes a lot of sexual boundaries that would have been considered by most people to be um, unacceptable to push at this time. Uh, you heard from the documentary that Florence um, had killed, uh, I think it was about 1,400 people in the 14th century for the crime of uh, sodomy or for participating in homosexual acts. Um, uh, this is a very interesting sculpture because there is a substantial disconnect between the title of the sculpture and its general subject and what the sculpture is really doing. Um, now it is David, and you probably know the story of David and Goliath at least a little bit. Uh, there's these two armies in the Old Testament. The Israelites uh, are one of them, and the Israelites look across the battlefield and they actually decided to participate in something that uh, armies did a lot in ancient history because nobody really likes to fight in wars. But the way you do it is you say, you take your best guy and we'll take our best guy and they'll meet together on the battlefield and whoever wins, you win the war. Well, the Israelites were uh, going to fight against the Philistines and the Philistines' best guy was a guy named Goliath. And he was massive, he was over eight feet tall, a uh, huge giant of a man. And when the Israelites look out, there was nobody who was willing to go out and fight uh, this Goliath, none of the soldiers. And then a young boy essentially volunteered for the job, 
um, with the logic being God is on our side and God will protect me, he will deliver me, he will allow me to accomplish this great task. They offer him armor, he turns it down, he simply walks and picks up a few stones from the river and has a sling. He slings a stone and hits Goliath right in the center of the head. He falls to the ground. David then goes and takes Goliath's sword and severs Goliath's head. So, based on that story, if you look at the sculpture, you can probably see what Donatello has done. Has taken the moment after uh, he has severed the head. Yeah, David's one foot rests on the top of Goliath's head. He holds in his very slight right arm a very large sword. Um, and so we have this narrative moment. But I'm guessing as you've looked at this image, there are probably some things that stick out to you as being slightly odd in conceiving of how you might sculpt this story. Um, again, this is one of those places we normally have a discussion, but I'll, I'll fill you in on what usually we discuss. And I want you to think about it as I'm asking, if I, if I ask you the question, what stands out to you about this that doesn't seem to match the story very well? Um, one thing that might stick out to you is the uh, body of David. It is a very youthful, um, effeminate body. Um, not a... Uh, it's a kid, basically. Um, uh, a almost prepubescent boy. Uh, and while David was young, generally speaking in the history of art, we'll see a number of Davids, both a little bit today and in other lectures, um, he's represented at least a little bit older uh, than this, at least after puberty. Um, and not only is he young, but even his stance, the position of his arms, the way his one arm is just barely able to kind of hold on to that giant sword, um, he is in a very effeminate position. His long hair, uh, everything about him kind of cries youth and effeminacy. Um... That, in and of itself, in a society that has outlawed homosexuality, uh, if you are a male patron, is a dangerous thing. Uh, to create uh, a sculpture of a young boy, or at least, I, I should note, if you haven't noticed, a young boy who is nude. Uh, the film made the note that this is actually the first uh, full-size nude sculpture of a man in bronze since the time of the ancient Greeks. So this idea of sculpting the male nude has not been a part of the artistic vocabulary now for thousands of years. So even taking that step, even sculpting male nudity would have been considered outlandish by most people and outside the bounds of what you should be allowed to do in art. Uh, but Donatello doesn't only sculpt a male nude, he sculpts a male nude young boy looking very effeminate. Um, so we not only have allusions to homosexuality, uh, but even uh, kind of the love of children, which is even crossing new moral boundaries that the society tended to frown upon. Um, one of the other things that usually sticks out to people, if I let a little bit of silence go by in the room, in this sculpture is that darn hat that our David is wearing. Um, so I want you to think about that. Why in the world? This is, this is not, this is clearly not the kind of hat that anybody imagines David from the Old Testament wearing. Um, uh, I want you to look at that hat and think about what the hat does. Um, now to fill you in, it is a contemporary Florentine style hat. So basically it's the kind of hat you could buy in Florence at the time. So think about what that does. To take this biblical figure of David just slaying Goliath, why do you throw a hat from the local hat shop on him? Um, I think it does a couple things. One of the things it does is it only emphasizes and eroticizes his nudity in a more severe way. Um, this is the idea that the kind of lingerie industry is based upon, that actually things are frequently more erotic when you have some kind of clothing uh, still in the game where it's not only nudity. Uh, there's something about having that hat on that makes the rest of his body seem more obviously nude and erotic. But I think probably more importantly, the thing that the hat really does 
is the hat takes this old biblical figure of David from thousands of years ago, and the hat makes him the boy down the street in Florence. It makes him a very present figure, not a prophet from thousands of years ago. And again, that only heightens the kind of illicit nature of this sculpture. But this is basically the sculpture of a nude boy wearing a Florentine hat. Now you can dress it up uh, with him standing on the head and holding the big sword, and you can title it David, but in the end, this is a very dangerous, from most people's perspectives at the time, type of art, where not only sexuality is overtly connoted, but sexuality um, involving children, which is even more uh, illicit. Uh, if he was pushing towards uh, Donatello, if he was pushing towards the classical past in his St. Mark, you can see the way in which he is now utilizing that but veering from it. We not only have nudity, but pretty uh, overt sexuality as well. Um, one of the things mentioned, if you're not buying it as a sexualized um, sculpture at this point, one of the things the film mentioned to detail, and I'll just show it here, is uh, on Goliath's glass helmet, there is this feather that sticks up. And notice the way in which that feather leads the viewer's eye all the way up the thigh of David, getting pretty close to um, his genitals. So um, there are other things to kind of enhance and focus the viewer on its eroticism, the hat, the feather, um, the pose, which um, would be maybe at least not so obvious if it was just a nude sculpture. So this is a, an issue of uh, a few things. A private patron who probably ha uh, is interested in nude young boys uh, from the looks of things, and him wanting art that reflects that, uh, that he likes looking at, and he being willing to pay for it. Um, uh, the other thing it's a, a factor of is, again, if that's what he wants, if he wants naked little boy um, in an erotic pose, why even bother with the David thing? Well, calling it David, putting his foot on Goliath's head and holding that big sword is the way in which you can basically weasel out of what it really is. It's the thing you say if you know the sculpture is going to offend people. But you say, no, this is the prophet David. <laughs> and that's a religious work of art, and religion is a very good thing. I'm using my money virtuously to commission religious art. So essentially here, religion is being used as an excuse to do other things. It's not about inspiring you know, religious sentiment in people's hearts and minds or making people act in the way the religion, uh, religious rules kind of want them to act. It's about religion covering the tracks of an artist who's participating in something that needs track covering to happen. <laughs> that if you're just sculpting sexualized boys, you are going to get in trouble, your patron could get in trouble, and so one of the ways you kind of cover up what you're really doing is through that title and those those details added in there. Um, at about the same time, uh, 1428, a couple years earlier, there's uh, another really landmark work of art, this time uh, a painting by an artist named Masaccio, and just as Donatello's David really moved art in a dramatically new direction, uh, male nudity, a, f a bronze sculpture of an individual, um, uh, sexuality, all these things that hadn't really been a part of the art world for over a thousand years now coming back full force. We get now something else here in Masaccio's painting, which likewise is going to really transform everything that comes after it. Though it's not nearly as illicit as Donatello's work, and it's also something that isn't necessarily based on what former artists did. It's something that is really new here in the Italian Renaissance. Though it's new because of at least ideas that have been unearthed or brought back to life that were present in uh, the original classical era. The thing which is new and dramatic here in Masaccio's painting, painting is something known as perspective. Uh, perspective is something you are all very used to. Those of you who are artists are familiar with it and probably have had to do it before. Even those of you who are not artists might have done it a little bit before. 
it's the idea that you can take a two-dimensional surface and make it look as if it is not flat, but it is in fact a space that has depth. Um, we see it all over the place and we're very used to it. But up to this point in time, nobody had seen it. If you ever saw something that was painted on a flat surface, it was very overtly flat. There was no sense that you were looking at an actual kind of window onto the world. Um, there was a sense that you were looking at very distinctly a painting. Uh, but when perspective is conceived of, this changes. Uh, the film mentioned Brunelleschi was one of the early purveyors of perspective, and he was, though uh, Masaccio tends to be even associated a little more closely with its invention. Just to show you a couple images, um, the basic notion of perspective on your right is you have a horizon line, and if you draw out what are called orthogonal lines from that, um, you get a sense of how to create depth. So if you have a road that looks like that, you have your road recede into the distance. It gives the illusion of space and depth. In the print on your left by, uh, again, an Albert Durer in 1530, you see the ways in which originally artists tried to calculate this. They would do things like tie strings to parts of the things they wanted to, to create and then position it and figure out where on the canvas it ought to fall. You can see here in Masaccio's Holy Trinity, here is the perspectival scheme, essentially. Um, these are the lines the artist would have drawn to create this. Now, one of the things, actually, let me show you um, one more image here. You see on the bottom there, the way it works is if you stand right in that spot and you look at the painting, uh, the things are done in a scale so that the people who appear to be in front of the, the crucifixion are slightly larger. Um, Christ's body is smaller than theirs because that's what happens when you go back into space. Um, and if you're standing right in that spot where those lines emanate from up towards the painting, it is an extremely convincing illusion. Um, uh, I wanted to give you a couple photographs of it actually in the building though, especially the one on your right, which is very low quality, but you can see a person in it, and so it gives you a sense of scale. Notice how if you walk right up next to this painting, uh, the illusion is kind of undone. For it to work, you have to be in that perfect spot. You have to be you know, 10 or 15 feet back. You have to be the right height. If you're standing right in that one spot, it is a very convincing illusion. But there are limitations, at least, to what perspective can do to fool the eye because uh, it's confined to that one spot. Um, now, going back to this, I want to make note of something. I mentioned before uh, when we were looking at da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, one of the things which happens during the Renaissance, when you value mankind, when you value individuals, when you value them as noble creations of God, one of the things that changes is you want to educate them, you want them to learn, you want them to make use of their own faculties. Um, and one of the things that happens with that, is one of the things which is unearthed from the classical past, which had been ignored and is reborn in the Renaissance, is mathematics, um, geometry. Uh, you've probably heard of things in your math classes like the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagoras was a classical thinker in ancient uh, Greece. So the, the roots of a lot of our geometry, algebra, mathematics generally come from the classical era. And those things had been kind of shut away for centuries. Now they're unearthed and artists are, usually, are realizing they can use them to their benefit. They can use these mathematical principles to create illusions in ways they couldn't before. Um, so this concept of perspective, where it seems like there is actual space and depth, which to us seems very normal at the time, was an earth-shattering development. Um, people came and looked at these paintings and could not believe their eyes, thought there was some kind of magic trick going on uh, that had brought the crucifixion of Christ back into this room. Um, it's hard for us to imagine because we've seen perspective our whole lives, but when you've never seen it before and then you're confronted with it, it it's, I guess, maybe the closest thing is maybe the, you might remember the first time you went and saw a 3D movie and the kind of amazement you had at the first. You get used to it and you kind of forget by the end of the movie you're even watching it in 3D. But when you first see it, um, when you went and saw Avatar or something for the first time, and that was the first time you really seen 3D, um, it's very dramatic at first, and that at least kind of a sensation, although I think even magnified. 
is what perspective did. And it lent art a new level of reality that it really hadn't, um, at least painting, hadn't ever had before. Oh, sorry. Now, um, this painting was also in the Medici documentary, Botticelli's Birth of Venus. And I just want to bring it in now to make another point about what's happening in the Renaissance. This is slightly later in the 1400s. And one thing that happens in the latter half of the century is we we got a little bit of taste of moving away from religion in, say, a sculpture like Donatello's David. It's called David, and it's sort of religious, but it's also kind of not really religious at all, um, as we talked about. Um, by the 1480s, though, Botticelli is now not even feeling the need to cover his tracks, essentially. He's created a work of art here, The Birth of Venus, Venus, the goddess of love and fertility, which is a kind of nice way of saying sex, um, uh, here nude herself. So you have the goddess of sex uh, in the nude, um, a very sexualized, um, erotic painting for the time, at least, when female nudity especially um, was very rarely, if ever, represented. Um, to create not only a painting of a female nude, which in and of itself is, is very outside the norm, uh, but to do it of a non-Christian subject matter, um, and not even non-Christian, but a pagan subject. She's a Greek, Roman, you know, mythological goddess. This is pagan stuff that Christians abandoned over a thousand years ago and said, we don't, we don't deal with that pagan stuff. Um, Botticelli's bringing it back. Um, so, not a Christian religious painting, but a pagan religious painting. Uh, but in the end, it's what we get is it's not about religion. We get a move away from religion here towards something fundamentally secular that's created independent of religion. Um, and extremely controversial at the time. We, you saw in the film that Botticelli, during the bonfire of the vanities, was forced to even throw some of his own paintings onto the fire. There was a harsh reaction in Florence against art of this kind and the kind of lifestyle that accompanies it um, that you saw with Savonarola and the Bonfire of the Vanities. The thing I think that's really interesting, though, so this is the 1480s, and this is, um, we're going to have the Bonfire of the Vanities, and we have to burn all this stuff. So at this point in time, creating non-religious, pagan, sexualized art like the Birth of Venus was considered to be extremely controversial. By the time we get to 1509, so we're talking 30 years later, this is also a very pagan painting, Raphael's School of Athens. Um, this is a painting that um, is not even trying to hide in any way, shape, or form um, the fact that it is not Christian. Um, at the center of the painting, you have Plato and Aristotle uh, discussing philosophy. Um, you have great philosophers throughout history, uh, mathematicians, writers, uh, Homer, uh, Pythagoras, all these great thinkers throughout history in this one space. And it's not a religious building, at least in a Christian sense. This is a very pagan work of art. It may not be quite as sexualized as the birth of Venus, but this is very pagan. The interesting thing is this work of art is not a private commission. This is not done because you have one wealthy person who has a little money and wants work of art of these pagan leaders. This work of art is in the Vatican. It's in uh, the seat of the Catholic Church. It is in a religious building. It's in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican City. Um, you go from 30 years earlier, this kind of a painting would have been deemed dangerous and scandalous by almost everybody in society. And 30 years later, this painting is in the seat of the Catholic Church and is totally acceptable. Now that has something to do with the fact that, as you saw in the film, you get uh, Medici uh, popes, uh, you get people who are really trained in this kind of secular lifestyle becoming popes due to probably not so much religious uh, reasons, but um, they're wealthy, they're influential, and various other reasons. But it also says something broader about this secularization coming through society. By 1509, it isn't considered to be quite so illicit and quite so dangerous. Rather, it's considered to be something that can be viewed 
in harmony with religion, that Plato and Socrates don't have to be feared, that we can study their philosophies um, and actually benefit from them, even if we are Christian, that the, the division between the classical past and the Christian present, which had been um, considered 100 years earlier to be very vast, and even 30 years earlier than this to be extremely vast, um, now is done away with in a lot of ways. And we have those two things coming together. Um, I'm not going to spend all the time pointing out who every person is. I'll, I'll note just one or two. Uh, in the front, you see a guy kind of leaning over on a block of stone. Um, that is probably the sculptor Michelangelo, who we're going to see in a minute, who was a fellow and slightly rival artist to Raphael, uh, put in that kind of contemplative pose on his block of marble there. Um, uh, let's go to the next uh, couple details there. You see on the right uh, the individual that is uh, has a, a chalkboard, basically. He has a compass. He's working on math down there, teaching people things. So education, again, coming through. And at the center of the painting, you have uh, Plato and Aristotle. Plato's theories had to do with the heavens and the ideal, and he's pointing up to that. Aristotle was much more uh, about the here and now and the earth, and so he's kind of referencing the ground or, or the here and now with his hand. So I want to shift now and talk about uh, one of the most famous artists of all time, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we looked a little bit at his Vitruvian Man, so you have a glimpse into da Vinci's interest. We talk about his interest in the human body, in mankind, as the kind of chief creation of God. Uh, da Vinci is the consummate Renaissance man. You might have heard that term before. Uh, whether you know what it means or not, a Renaissance man today in common language is somebody who dabbles in a lot of different things and is proficient at a wide variety of things. And um, it's the term really comes from Leonardo da Vinci during the Renaissance. He was a painter, but he was much more than that. He was an inventor. He was a... a uh, medical student. He was a lot of things. And he spent his time and used his talent with art making to do a range of things. You see two images here. Uh, the one on the left is a, a drawing he made of a woman, uh, a female body he dissected, uh, who was pregnant. Um, this was something at the time that was not allowed. It was not like you could go to medical school do this. It was um, thought to be improper and illegal to dissect corpses of human bodies, um, yet he did it anyways. He was determined to understand how the body worked as a means at understanding how God worked. Um, and he not only took it apart, but he draw what he found, and he wrote what he found. Uh, there's a lot of words here. He famously wrote in a backwards language to disguise his findings. This was an era before copyright, so he was discovering things, and he wanted to um, keep those discoveries uh, for himself, or at least he wanted to tell them to only people he wanted to tell them to. He didn't want other people to claim credit for what he had done. Um, on the right, you see the design for a multi-barreled gun, uh, essentially a machine gun of sorts before machine guns were invented. So he's taking apart bodies, but he's also inventing weapons. Uh, so he used his artistic abilities to explore a wide variety uh, of things. With regard to specifically how he made art, though, sorry, I'm trying to advance my slide here. Uh, with regard to how he made art, though, uh, with regard to how he painted, he did a couple really unique things. Uh, one of the unique things he did, I think, becomes very apparent in these two images. Uh, the one on your left is the sketch for uh, an unfinished painting, a painting he never made of the Madonna and the child, of Christ and his mother. And on the right is another page from his sketchbook of a day when he sat around staring at a couple of cats. Um, and he draws these cats over and over again, but he never draws them the same way twice. He clearly was observing these cats, 
and observing the different ways that they acted and the different ways they looked when they acted. Uh, the ways in which emotions were conveyed through body posture, through expressions on the cat's faces, uh, through positions they took. He was trying to understand the ways in which you can convey ideas through gesture uh, and through expression. Um, and notice how then that study of the cat is translated over to his image of the Christ child and Mary. Um, a very traditional uh, painting, right? I mean, we've seen, I've shown you this one uh, in this very lecture. Uh, it's a very, usually a very kind of solemn image. Uh, Christ often looks like a little kind of shrunken down man because it's kind of hard, hard for some people to conceive of the creator of the universe as being a kind of babbling baby who drools and can't control his bowels and various things. Um, so there's a kind of formula that you're supposed to pre present the mother and the child in, uh, but da Vinci really defies that. He instead puts uh, the Christ child on the map, lap of his mother, and he's holding a cat, and you can see the cat trying to squirm away. He clearly realized from sketching his cats all day that cats like to do that. Um, that's what happens when you try to pose for a picture and you put the cat in, right? It's not gonna wanna stay very long, and the kid kind of playfully tries to hold on to the cat as it riles away, and the mother kind of looks halfway down at the funny scene. That's different than what you see on your left. It's not formulaic. It's actually very um, happenstance. It's very random. It's a, it's a brief moment, but it's a moment that makes sense to people. It's a moment from somebody who's had a child or had a cat or had both that is knowable. It's conceivable. It's understandable. It's a very human moment. And if your goal is not to just portray God in all his baby glory, uh, but your, your goal is to try to make God more understandable, more conceivable, more knowable as the Christ child. Uh, that's what da Vinci does. He uses gestures, he uses expressions to create a kind of emotion about the scene that makes it more relatable to people who are actually looking at the image. Uh, and we see where he uh, takes, again, what he learned from the cat, and he then applies it to uh, probably his most famous uh, religious painting, which is of the Last Supper. Um, this is a painting uh, that is in Milan, uh, in Italy. Uh, it's a very common subject. Uh, the night before Christ is to go be crucified, he has a uh, a dinner with his 12 apostles. Now, da Vinci does a few things here that are, are radically new. Uh, one of them is a bad thing. Uh, well, at least it's bad for us looking at the painting today. It's not in great condition. This painting was, uh, well, it is a fresco. Now, you saw in the movie, in the Medici documentary, uh, what a fresco is. Uh, you saw it when actually you saw them, Michelangelo in the process of creating the Sistine Chapel. The word fresco means fresh, and it refers to the fact that you lay down fresh or wet plaster, and you essentially make your painting right into the plaster, so you almost dye the plaster, and then as it hardens, um, you have your image, and it's very durable. Um, you can cover large areas of ground with it, um, uh, and so it's good for those reasons. It's bad because it's very difficult to do and it's hard to get a lot of detail because once the plaster is dry, you're done. Um, so you usually lay a few uh, sections, you know, maybe a four by four foot section of plaster and paint it and then lay another one the next day because you can't go back and fix mistakes. So you have to be very good at it. Uh, da Vinci didn't like fresco for this reason. It, was, it, it posed some unique challenges. He actually tried a new experiment here. He tried to use oil paint with his fresco. Um, we haven't talked about oil painting yet because it actually is invented somewhere else. and We'll talk about it next class. Uh, but it's a different form of paint, and he experimented with it here. Um, and it worked all right at the time, but it didn't hasn't held up very well. Instead, it has actually flaked off a good bit, so it's not in the best condition. 
But on the good side of things Da Vinci did here that were new and interesting, um, uh, well, there's a few things I want to mention. One is the way in which you see, again, he's integrated gestures to co communicate ideas. Notice how each one of these figures uh, is in a, a distinct pose and frequently uses their hands to communicate something, pointing to themselves, gesturing to others, um, uh, so that it's not just a story of people eating dinner, but rather there's something that comes up. They're talking, they're communicating. Um, there is a point in the Last Supper in the narrative where Christ informs his apostles that one of them will betray him. And the apostles say, Lord, is it I? Uh, most people think that's what this moment is. A lot of people gesture to themselves or question one another, and it seems like that might be what they're discussing. So he uses gestures to make this a much more dynamic event than it usually was when it was portrayed by artists. It was usually kind of a bland uh, dinner, but he, he uses gesture to make it more dramatic. Um, you might be able to tell he uses one point perspective. Um, in this scene, I'm actually going to skip forward here. Uh, this is a diagram of the perspectival scheme. You can see that the vanishing point, meaning where all those lines go, ends right at the head of Christ. So all the angles in the image direct your eye to that central point where you have three windows right behind it, perhaps resent. Uh, representing the, the Trinity, the idea of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, and so he uses perspective to focus you in on the figure of Christ, but he uses perspective for another reason and to another ends as well. In this image, you can see the painting actually where it is today. Um, where it is is it was painted for a dining hall in a monastery. So monks would go to eat their meals in this space. So the fact that he chose the Last Supper as subject is not random. It's not just, well, here's a good idea, here's a story in, in the Old Test or in the New Testament where they ate dinner before he's crucified. But rather it's a story which actually very literally connects to what the people would be doing who'd be looking at it. So as you sit down to eat your meal, you look up and Christ is at the table of the Last Supper. So he uses the subject to connect to his viewers in a very intimate way but he also uses perspective to accomplish that same ends. Um, he develops a perspectival system, and he decorates the interior of the space where Christ is eating exactly as the room itself is decorated. In fact, if you could see up on the top of the ceiling, it mirrors the type of ceiling Christ paints in the scene, or sorry, Da Vinci paints in the scene of Christ. So that as you sit down, to eat your, your dinner as a monk. Not only do you look up and see Christ eating, but it almost looks as if there is literally another room attached to your dining hall in which Christ is eating. A room that looks like the one you're in and that through the use of perspective even looks like it recedes back into space. So he uses in this painting both gesture and perspective to focus you to, to convey ideas in the narrative, but also to convince you that this is a real thing. This is happening. And to make you, as a viewer, be able to relate to it in a more intimate way than you would be able to in just a regular work of art. Uh, I mentioned your standard um, scene. This is a random one from the Arena Chapel we saw earlier of the Last Supper. And again, the people just kind of sit around a table so you see the ways in which gesture really changes it in a, in a dynamic way and brings something new out of the narrative. Okay, um, I want to talk now about uh, the other extremely famous artist to come out of the Italian Renaissance, a guy named Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo, uh, as you saw in the film, was a kind of child genius. He was uh, basically adopted by the Medici family and brought into their home. He spent his life making art commissioned uh, by the Medici in different places. We'll see the Sistine Chapel in just a minute. Um, so he has a very interesting relationship with this family, a kind of push and pull, love-hate relationship with them. Um, and you were introduced in the movie to this sculpture you saw. Uh, the ways in which he labored over it, the ways in which he created it by creating uh, 
a wax model and gradually lowering the level every day and then just sculpting what he saw. Uh, you uh, weren't privy to all the details. I want to fill in a few gaps. Uh, there was a massive block of marble um, that the somebody in the city had procured, but everybody was afraid to sculpt it. Um, it was so substantial that um, everybody was nervous because when you sculpt in marble, there is no room for error. One wrong swing of your uh, hammer hitting your chisel and the arm falls off and you're done. So it's a, it's a very daunting task to sculpt in marble, especially when it's hard to get very large single blocks of marble, which this was. Um, so he, nobody else wants to do it. Uh, not only is it a gamble because it's a very large block of marble and you might make mistakes, but it's a gamble because the block of marble has a crack in it. So whatever you sculpt in it, you have to integrate it into, you have to negotiate that crack. Uh, but Michelangelo is undaunted and creates what is hailed as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, sculptures of all time. Um, a few things to note about it. It is very clearly based off classical precedents, that contrapposto pose. I mentioned already earlier in this lecture, we saw an ancient Greek art where one foot bears the weight, one side of the body's in motion, the other arm uh, is in some, doing something, in this case holding the sling over his shoulder. Uh, the idea of the male nude, which was again part of Greek art. Um, the ideal face and body. Um, everything about it, this is a kind of sculpture which could basically be plucked from ancient Greece, um, but it's somebody, uh, you know, 2,000 years later uh, doing it, utilizing ancient Greek precedents as the basis for it. Uh, it was originally designed, as you heard in the film, to go on the top of the Florence Cathedral. Um, that's one of the reasons it's so large, and it's one of the reasons, as you look at it, you might have noticed that actually... Everything isn't quite perfect in that the hands are extremely large and the head is actually too large for the body. That's not a mistake. It's actually a, an artistic mechanism known as forced perspective. Uh, when you're putting something on top of a building, everybody's going to be looking at it from the ground up. And one of the ways you compensate for the odd angle people are looking at it in is by making certain things larger on top and smaller on bottom. So actually, when you look up from the ground, it looks like it's in the proper perspective. Um, when he finished it, though, everybody was so amazed at the quality of the work that it seemed a shame to put it high up on a building because the reality is you don't really see quality of work when it's hundreds of feet up in the air. Uh, and so instead, the sculpture was placed in the city square. Uh, I think one of the best moments in the Medici documentary is when James Saslow, one of the art historians, says uh, context determines meaning in this case, and always with art history. If you stick this sculpture on top of a religious building, it's a religious sculpture. It's David the prophet slaying the giant Goliath. Uh, but the second you put it in front of the government building in a city square, in a public place, it's transformed. Now David becomes something else. And there's a couple theories at what he becomes. Um, in the film, one of the art historians mentioned that uh, he really thinks this sculpture is about uh, Michelangelo's relationship with uh, the Medici. That the Medici are Goliath and Michelangelo is David, this kind of underdog who isn't born into privilege but who has slayed the giants. Um, that might be a, a narrow reading of it for most people, but I definitely think that it's at least fair to say that Florence saw itself as kind of a David. Uh, Rome was down the road. Rome was bigger. Rome was the head of the Catholic Church. It had bigger armies. It had the Colosseum. It had the Pantheon, major works of architecture and art. Uh, Florence was an important place, maybe the most important place during the Renaissance, but it was smaller didn't have the history that Rome had. It didn't have the army that Rome had. Um, and the, I think it's definitely fair to say that when people saw the David in the city square, uh, the Florence, uh, David became a symbol for Florence. It is the underdog who, uh, despite what you might think on the surface, 
can slay giants. Um, so it becomes a piece of Republican art. It becomes a piece of political art, even though at the core it's a religious subject. Um, so context really does shape the meaning. The exact same sculpture in two different places, on top of a cathedral or in front of a government building, becomes something entirely different. Now, I want to compare it uh, for a moment to our previous David we saw, Donatello's David. You notice we've got a number of new things here. First of all, despite the fact that we have maintained male nudity, um, it is now a much older David. We've gotten rid of that hat, which, as I made the argument, I think really eroticizes the sculpture. Um, and while I don't know that you ever totally get away from the idea of the erotic when you're dealing with nudity, uh, let's say that, that the erotic component of Michelangelo's version is definitely much less severe, uh, if it's there at all. Um, uh, he's much older. Uh, his body, his face, his muscles, all of those things speak to that. The effeminacy and the youthfulness uh, of the prepubescent Donatello's David have been erased. He is now an older, more mature man. Uh, he's not extremely old, but he's, he's definitely older. Um, he's also selected a different moment. This is not the post, uh, I've already slain Goliath and now I'm cutting off his head moment. This is before the battle. This is David with his sling looking out across at the challenge he faces, uh, looking at Goliath. Uh, so there's something very different in this image of preparing for the task rather than it already being done. Um, and I think I want to bring in a couple details here as we look at what uh, Michelangelo does. I think the way he sculpts that face and the gaze he sculpts is important. There's a lot of determination behind David's eyes. Um, this is the, the moment where you definitely should maybe experience fear. Um, there might be a little bit of hint, if anything, of that, but overwhelmingly we get a sense of determination, of confidence, of uh, ability to accomplish the task, even if there might be a little bit of fear because it is a big task. Uh, David goes forth with the knowledge that both he, with God's help, can, can slay the giant. Um, I think there is also something, just a broader point to be drawn out here about the Renaissance. Um, uh, and this connects again back to what we first started to see in da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, that the Renaissance is a period in which intellect, knowledge, um, are valuable things. And I think there is behind um, David's gaze there something somewhat intellectual. Um, he's thinking. Uh, he is wrapped up in thought, contemplating this task. And that large head and those eyes, I think the intensity of his gaze say something about an intellectual person in David. It's not just a physical thing he's accomplishing. In fact, you might say that what he does, picking up a stone, putting it in a sling, and flinging it and hitting it in Goliath's head, is not only a physical act. Um, it's not necessarily strength that allows him to win. Strength is why Goliath would win, but it's smarts, sort of. It's a recognition that it doesn't matter that he's eight feet tall and I'm not. It matters if this little simple stone can hit him in the precisely right spot. Um, so there is something, I think, intellectual about what David does, and I think Michelangelo brings that out in uh, the sculpture here. So continuing with Michelangelo, um, I want to talk about his painting on uh, the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which you also got a glimpse of in the Medici documentary. Um, uh, and this is a, a kind of central image, which I want to spend some time on. But let me first give you a kind of glimpse of the entire project and talk about where it came from. Um, uh, this was uh, a chapel. It is a chapel where the Pope conducts mass for the cardinals in the Vatican. Um, originally, it had a lot of uh, paintings. You can see on the, the, the image on your right there, if you look down on the bottom, the paintings on the sides, which kind of panels, those were already there. But the, the ceiling and the wall you can see in the distance were nothing but painted blue with kind of uh, stars on them, kind of like the heavens. Uh, 
Michelangelo was brought in by the Pope at the time and given uh, the job to paint the ceiling. Now, Michelangelo uh, is not so much a painter. Um, he definitely fashions himself as a sculptor. That is his natural medium. And he felt that this commission was being given to him uh, because his rivals were trying to kind of take him away from sculpture. Uh, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But he definitely was resistant to this project. He didn't, he, he didn't like it. Um, he basically told the Pope, he said, well, I'll paint your ceiling, but I'm not going to only paint the ceiling. The Pope only wanted him to do the, the, the center of it. And he said, if you're going to let me do it, I got to do the whole ceiling. And I want to paint the sides of the ceiling coming down. And I want to paint the end of the room. I want to do the whole thing. Whether or not Michelangelo was using this to try to weasel out of the commission, or whether that's really what he wanted to do, um, the Pope said, okay, fine, do that. And he was stuck. Um, and it was a large job that took many years. You can see as you look at the image on the left looking up, there are... Uh, a number of moments from the Bible, the creation of the stars, the creation of Adam, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, the flood, all these crucial biblical moments kind of running down the center. And then on the sides, in these little niches, you get uh, a lot of figures, a number of which are famous prophets. We'll look at Jeremiah in a minute. Um, and then there's some other figures, which we'll talk about too, that are just kind of there for decoration. Um, but let's come back to this image of uh, the creation of Adam. Uh, one thing I will take issue with from the movie, uh, when this painting is being talked about, uh, one of the guys says something about Michelangelo, about how the person who we consider to be the greatest painter of all time didn't consider himself a painter. Well, He's right in that he didn't consider himself a painter, um, but I, I think it's a big stretch to say Michelangelo is the greatest painter of all time. Uh, there's some weaknesses in him as a painter. I think he's a much better sculptor than he is painter. One of the things he does, and we'll see this a little more in a minute probably, but he's not good at the female body. <laughs> he's pretty good at the male body, uh, but women come out very muscular. Now this might be an in, in, on purpose, it might be intentional, uh, he did consider the male body to be superior to the female body, and maybe that's why all the women are so muscular. But in all honesty, I think there's a number of things as you look at the painting. Uh, it's him dealing with a medium he's not entirely comfortable with. This is not what he does, uh, and he's learning as he goes along in some ways. That being said, I don't want to discount that this is an amazing painting, and uh, especially this as a whole project is one of the most amazing works of art uh, of all time, almost undoubtedly. But the central panel, I think, says a lot about the Renaissance as a time. Um, if uh, we saw a Vitruvian man, uh, and I count, I, I juxtapose that with a medieval cathedral where mankind is viewed as very small and insignificant in relation to God, this image, this central panel, really does posit a very unique and a very intimate connection between God and man. If you look at this painting, um, there is very little separating God and man in a lot of ways. Not only physically, there's you know a couple inches of white space between their fingers, but God is the same size as Adam. They look like an actual father and son might look. They're in the same scale. They have the same body parts, the same hands and biceps and uh, hair and all these things that this is not an unknowable you know, force in the universe. This is a being that has form and that looks like a human being, essentially. That is a very different God. That's not the kind of God you are presented with in a cathedral. That is a massive, unknowable force in the universe that you stand very small in relation to. This is a God which is not only looks like you, but he reaches out to try to get to you. Uh, if anybody's making the effort here, it is... Uh, God in heaven who is trying to get to man. Um, there is an effort made by this being which looks very familiar to try to connect to them. So this really does, again, posit a new connection between God and man, which we didn't see in the medieval era, 
where God is knowable, he is similar to mankind, and he cares about mankind in a very intimate way. Um, I want to point out uh, especially one thing here, and it has to do with this kind of fabric-y drapery that God uh, is engulfed in, and where these kind of angelic beings live right behind uh, God the Father there. Uh, a few years ago, somebody who's not an art historian, who's actually a, uh, a surgeon, made an interesting uh, assessment that most people think is rather plausible now. If you look at the shape that that uh, kind of drapery is flowing in, uh, what do you think of it looks like anything to you, including that kind of piece of green drapery that comes down at the bottom? Uh, a doctor looked at this and said, that looks exactly like a bifurcated brain, which is, you, you know how the brain has two hemispheres, and if you cut it down the middle and look at a kind of cross-section of the brain, the drapery there is in the exact shape of a brain, and even that green thing that comes down is, is part of the brain. Um, and the theory goes then, uh, perhaps this is one of Michelangelo's way of signifying intelligence. You take the thing uh, which human beings tend to associate intelligence with in our brains, and you kind of take the ultimate being who represents intelligence and God, and you fuse him in the shape of the brain, again, connecting God as our creator, uh, giving us the thing which by which we can become intelligent. He kind of is, is in this halo of it. Um, you might not buy that, but I think it is legitimate. I mean, you saw in the film Da Vinci is procuring corpses and dissecting them and drawing what he sees. So Michelangelo, to say that he could have been familiar with the image of the brain and intentionally created God kind of in this brain-like space, uh, I don't think it's as far-fetched as you might be inclined to, to assume. Uh, I want to show you just a couple images here from the side. On the right is Jeremiah, the prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet who foretold a lot of doom and destruction, and he sits in a very contemplative pose, uh, much like uh, da Vinci using gesture and things to create um, narrative components, or at least tie a distinct quality to this individual. Um, maybe even more so than da Vinci, Michelangelo is really interested in using not only gesture, but poses that are very dramatic. Over here on your left is one of the figures which are simply referred to as sibyls. They aren't individuals from the Bible. They are allegorical figures that represent bigger, broader ideas. This one is kind of twisting around to handle a large book. Um, you can see this is one of the places where the female body kind of gets very muscly and takes very uh, masculine characteristics. Um, but more importantly is that's a very dramatic pose where the legs, notice the way they toes are bearing the weight, uh, they bend in dramatic ways, and then the torso is turning away from the viewer and the head turning back. A very dramatic pose. Uh, this is a piece of a fragment of classical sculpture that was in the, the Pope's collection at the time. So it's something Michelangelo would have had access to and would have studied. And you can see the ways in which he is taking again the classical past and re- infusing classical precedence into the present day during the Renaissance, that that concept of rebirth from the classical period is really coming to fruition. This is another sculpture that was in the Pope's collection, uh, the Laocoon. Again, we have this, this twisting, turning, contorted body that is very expressive in and of itself. Um, here's another comparison. This is another one of the uh, figures used to just kind of decorate the space on the Sistine Chapel. And you can see the way in which he's basically copying that, that torso, but the way in which he's inventing something that I'm guessing you didn't assume when you just looked at the torso, that that guy would have had his arm wrapped around his back and that his leg would have been bent so much that it's uh, flush with the upper thigh. So he's really making up, he's taking kind of basic poses and then twisting them in very dramatic ways. So that the body itself becomes extremely expressive. I want to conclude uh, the discussion of Michelangelo with these two sculptures. Um, these are sculptures that are generally referred to as the captives or sometimes the prisoners. 
Um, I don't have a, a date on them because we're not totally certain when they were begun or finished or if they're finished. Um, you can tell that these are sculptures that look basically half finished. You start to see bodies kind of coming out of them, being formed, but it looks as if they were, uh, you know, as if Michelangelo died or something in the process of making them, they never got completed. Um, there's a possibility that they um, didn't get completed. Uh, uh, they were going to be part of a larger project. But we think actually the odds are better that Michelangelo liked leaving them this way. He wanted them to look this way. And so if that's the case, we have to ask why. Why, if you're a sculptor, do you make sculptures that are half finished? Um, and here's the, the idea. Michelangelo was extremely invested in altering people's conceptions of what an artist was. An artist during the medieval era, people who built those cathedrals and made that beautiful stained glass and those sculptures and gargoyles and everything on a cathedral, we don't know any of their names hardly um, uh, because they were considered to be craftspeople. They were considered to have a job, they make stained glass and they make it. Uh, just like, you know, Joe down the street makes horseshoes and Bob down the road makes shoes, I make stained glass. And we all just make stuff. Those are what, that's what a craftsman is. And a craftsman isn't afforded any special status in society. They don't necessarily make uh, more money than your average craftsperson, and they're definitely not uh, given any special you know, place in social hierarchy due to the fact that they make things. During the Renaissance, a lot of artists tried to reconfigure what an artist was in society and to try to make a claim that artists were not just craftspeople. But artists were something different. Part of this has to do with this new emphasis on education we've seen, or at least we talked about earlier in the Vitruvian Man with regard to Da Vinci. This idea of uh, becoming an artist was not just about learning a trade. Becoming an artist was becoming, you had to learn lots of things. If you want to become a good painter, you had to learn math. So you knew about perspective. Um, you had to have a breadth of knowledge in order to make good art. Therefore, uh, the idea was if you weren't a thinker, you couldn't be a good artist. And, and those were intimately connected. Now, you could make good horseshoes and not, not be a thinker. You could make good good uh, shirts and, and trade those and sell those and not be a thinker. But if you were going to make art, you had to be educated. You had to be trained. You had to have a depth of thought, which would then allow you to make works that had depth themselves in them. One of the ways that artists made an argument for themselves as different than their average craftsperson is to essentially try to argue that they aren't what they aren't craftspeople. What they are is creators. They create things. Now, when you create something, that's different than if you just make something, because there's somebody out there that is a creator, and that person is God. God doesn't just make stuff. God creates things, and that is a more noble pursuit. So when Michelangelo uh, left these sculptures the way they were, he made a statement that he talked about um, the process by which he created them, but not as I, I make a sculpture. He said what he was doing is he was bringing forth the life that was already there in the stone. So there's a block of marble, and he's saying there's something alive in there. And what I do is I unleash it. I give birth to it. I, I facilitate its life. That's different than I, you know, make swords or I bake bread. This is facilitating life the way God facilitates life. And so when he left these probably intentionally unfinished, it was to some degree to make that argument that what he's doing is not just sculpting. He is unleashing life where nobody else perceives life as even being a parent there. Uh, he's giving it birth as a mother births her child or as God creates, uh, has created mankind. And so I want to just come back to this image before leaving Michelangelo to say that the fact that for the centerpiece of the Sistine Chapel, he chose this image of the creation of Adam, it, it isn't only because it's a good biblical story. It's because he's constantly implying throughout his life that what he does is not just make stuff. What he does is 
create things. He brings forth life as an artist. So when he chooses that idea as the centerpiece for this massive commission, it's likewise alluding to God as a creator and me as an artist as having a special kinship with God because we are the people who create, who bring forth life where other people don't see it. And I want to just bring in this painting really quick. You saw this painting in the film. This is Botticelli's Adoration of the Magi. And this is the painting that Botticelli puts uh, Lorenzo de Medici and Giuliano, his brother, in the scene of the birth of Christ. But maybe most importantly, on the far right side in those kind of orange robes, Botticelli places himself. Uh, another way in which artists made the case that they were more than just your average craftsman was by including themselves in these paintings, not only alongside Lorenzo de' Medici, who's the most important person alive in Florence at the time, but literally at the birth of Christ. That elevates you. If you are there at the birth of Christ, you are an important person. So the artist has the ability to make that kind of an argument that your average craftsperson necessarily can't make uh, by in re-envisioning himself in these important historical dramas alongside important people. So we see the way in which religious art here is used um, to really elevate the status of the artist. Now I kind of don't want to show you this painting, but I kind of have to. <laughs> uh, if there was any painting you knew coming into this class, if you knew almost nothing about art, you probably have heard of the Mona Lisa, uh, maybe the most famous painting in the world. I don't want to show it to you because I don't really like the Mona Lisa. Uh, I think it is absurd that it's the most famous painting in the world. I wish it wasn't, uh, but it is, and if I don't show it, you'll ask why. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in a lot of depth. Um, let's say that, it, in short, paintings become famous for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's because they're the most famous paintings of their era. The reason I showed you Michelangelo's David is not only is it a great work of art, just on, on my estimation, but it was extremely important at its time and place. It affected the way people thought about life, about politics, about religion, about lots of things. Um, the Mona Lisa was not that. It was not a painting that was well known or extremely famous. It's a painting that has an odd history. It's a painting that has a lot of unanswered questions around it. It's a painting that has some weird things going on in the painting. And all of that has led to a lot of people talking about it, writing about it, and in the end, a lot of people lining up to look at it. It's a painting that if you ever go to Paris to see it, you will almost inevitably be disappointed. <laughs> it's a pretty small painting behind multiple layers of glass. It isn't very striking in person. In fact, if you're ever there, I would advise you to turn to the side instead. And there's some other da Vinci paintings, which I think are much better and much more interesting and much more striking. Um, uh, with regard to the oddity of the painting, there's some questions over whether or not this was an actual portrait of a woman. There are some documents that there was a woman who went by this name at the time, uh, but we don't necessarily have documents of her commissioning art. Uh, it could be a kind of look at the, uh, the idea of an ideal woman from da Vinci's perspective. There's a lot of books written at the time about the ideal woman and what she would look like. In fact, there's some very distinct passages from some of those books about the ideal woman having a very slight smile and some things. And so maybe that's what it is. There is a very odd kind of Middle Earth-esque J.R. Tolkien landscape in the background where the hobbits apparently live. Um, very imaginative, not your standard background you'd put behind somebody in a portrait. So he is, uh, Da Vinci's doing some odd things that we just don't necessarily know why. Um, it's not that it's not a beautiful painting, it's just that I don't find it extremely interesting, or at least as interesting as most other paintings, and it, it gets a lot of attention, I think, that is slightly undue. So I'm going to kind of leave it at that. I brought in this portrait of Raphael, uh, by Raphael, of Castiglione, who was a writer and a thinker and a renaissance man of his age. Um, to pair with it, I guess to make a broader point, that what was valued in the renaissance were individuals of ability. Uh, there is, during the Renaissance, we start to see a breakdown of people only being judged based on where they were born, uh, and a little bit of what today we call social mobility, where you have a little bit of freedom that if you're a great, uh, writer, if you go to school and you have a great talent for writing, you can become an important person in that society. That was very rare in the medieval era. Uh, 
you generally stayed where you were born. We're, this idea is going to come up more in future lectures as we go throughout time. And we'll talk about something known as the Enlightenment, where this really starts to change. But in these portraits, I think we do see a little bit of that, of people who aren't of noble birth, but uh, who have portraits painted, who have attention devoted to them because of some other reason. Sometimes it's just they have money. Other times it's because they have ability, like Castiglione, as a writer, uh, as a thinker. And that is an important part of the Renaissance. Okay, um, I'm done with my Renaissance lecture, uh, but don't push stop quite yet. I only put this painting up here to give you a heads up on your reading assignment for next time. You're going to read uh, about this painting. Uh, the artist's name is Jan van Eyck, and it's called sometimes the Arnolfini Wedding Portrait, sometimes the Arnolfini Double Portrait. Um, the disconnect in those two titles is basically what the article is about. Is this an image of a wedding? And if it is, why are there so many weird things going on? Um, read it thoroughly. It's long, but I think it's pretty straightforward. He tries to dig up evidence of, to try to figure out what this painting meant at its time, why it would have been commissioned. Um, and he talks about other theories that people have had and why they seem to be not very good theories. And then he presents three theories of his own and try to look for what those theories might be and why the other theories might kind of fall flat. So you've seen the image. Uh, you can uh, the, the images in your article are kind of bad, so you can look here. You can Google it if you want to, but um, read about it, and I will talk to you next time. And next time we will talk about uh, uh, what we call the Northern Renaissance, which is where this painting was made in basically the same time period as the Renaissance, but in Northern Europe instead of down in Italy. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Take care.